Hi everyone, this is Akanksha and I'll be moderating this session, which is Preserving Privacy While Sharing Data by Gordon Half. And uh, we'll be starting in another two, three minutes, I think, or we should wait for more people to join in. All right, then I think we are good to start now. Uh, I'm going to play the, let me know if you are unable to hear or, or if there's some technical difficulty. So here we go. I'm Gordon Half, Emerging Technology Evangelist at Red Hat. And today I'd like to talk with you about preserving privacy while sharing data. Sharing data can accelerate innovation in a lot of different fields. Telecoms to healthcare, to governments to energy and so forth. And this is particularly true with all these open data sets out there that we can combine together in various ways. And this whole process is being accelerated as well by the fact that some of the best techniques that we've come up with recently, such as deep learning, many types of machine learning, really require vast amounts of data in order to be effective. But there's a problem. Data can be sensitive data can be private. So it becomes important to think about ways that we can share and act on data without revealing information that people and organizations don't want to be revealed. And that's the subject of today's talk. Before we dive down into the details, let's look at a map of the territory, so to speak. This comes from Andrew Krask of Open Uh, as it is for example being computed upon and aggregated and see here things like homomorphic encryption fully homomorphic encryption zero knowledge proofs i'm not going to spend time down there today because fully homomorphic encryption while it's a very interesting technique because it allows you to uh, have computation done for example, on a public cloud provider where the data that is being worked on is all encrypted. So there is no opportunity, no real need for, for trust in organizations in order to protect the confidentiality of that data. But it's very compute intensive, although it's an area of uh, significant research today is interesting, but really isn't practical in a, any kind of a production sense today. I will spend some time, however, talking about multi-party computation, uh, which as you see overlaps with the policy enforcement circle up there, because the protocol that's used for multi-party computation does in a sense provide a policy around the protection of data confidentiality. But at the same time, it is also a way to get into a privacy. But I'll be spending some more time in that. Trusted execution environments are also in that same general category. This is also an area of active research uh, with things like Confidential Computing Consortium, uh, Project NARCS being one of the uh, projects that are associated with PEEs. And again, those are ways that you can, for example, execute operations on a cloud provider and you don't need to trust much of the underlying software stack because the PEE provides certain types of attestation and so forth that makes that trust unnecessary. In the lower right hand corner, and this is where I'm going to spend the bulk of my time here today, uh, is, is how do you protect the privacy of data that's being shared and that's being aggregated. And a lot of traditional anonymization techniques go in here, although some of those arguably apply to input privacy as well. But a particular technique I'm going to talk about 
this area is differential privacy, um, which essentially brings formal methods to aggregating uh, collections of data. So those are the areas that we're going to look at today. Let's start by talking about anonymization more generally, though, and very closely related to this, and we can probably just take them as being the same thing for our purposes today, is pseudo-anonymization, uh, which is rather than stripping out uh, data, sensitive data, from a record, is replacing the sensitive data with some sort of token or pseudonym if you would uh, in those particular fields. And certainly the, the naive or the simple way of thinking about anonymization is simply that we are removing things like names, addresses, social security numbers, those kind of classic identifying uh, fields that would go be attached to some sort of record of things like healthcare information or financial records and so forth. Um, we can also encrypt or transform personal data fields to make them harder to de anonymize. So, for example, in a healthcare record, you might have a date of birth. And when you, in fact, you won't certainly have a date of birth. However, when you share that data, maybe the exact date of birth isn't very important. Maybe it's fine just to say somebody is 30 years old or they were born in a particular year or maybe even if they were born in a particular decade and obviously there's a certain art to figuring out you know, how much you can um, transform data before it becomes less useful but nonetheless it is a technique that can be used to help protect the um, sensitive information in a set of data. And then finally, you can aggregate by a trusted agency. And this still doesn't provide perfect anonymization for reasons that I'll get into. But uh, it's certainly a very common way of protecting individual data points while still having a meaningful set of data that is uh, aggregated up across a population. And a uh, you know, very good example of this that's very familiar to a lot of people is census, demographic, et cetera, types of data that the U.S. Census aggregates uh, in various ways that they, uh, they try to preserve anonymity of the individuals who have taken a survey. And I'm going to talk about that in a lot more detail in a few slides. And the question is, does all of this work? And the answer is yes, kind of, sort of. A lot of the time, it depends upon what your assumptions are, because there are quite a few challenges. So the first is even defining what constitutes personal data in the first place. And this doesn't have a straightforward answer because, for example, something like salary data, for example, uh, might be considered by many people to be personal, sensitive types of data. And yet it's required to be disclosed in some situations, uh, for instance, government and employees in much of the U.S. Uh, and in some countries, it's a norm that that salary data is public. So you first of all have to determine what actually constitutes sensitive data. And this can also be complicated for reasons I'll get to in a moment. Uh, I Sorry for the interruption. I'm going to try to reshare my screen so that you can hear him properly. Situations, uh, uh, government employees in much of the U.S. Uh, and in some countries, it's a norm that, that salary data is public. 
So you first of all have to determine what actually constitutes sensitive data. And this can also be complicated for reasons I'll get to in a moment. Uh, I'm a trusted aggregator in the last slide, but you know, who can you really trust? Uh, a lot of private organizations sell data for profit these days. And also, you know, there's data breaches. Uh, do you trust a company to keep your personal records safe? There is also some specific technical issues that relate to aggregating data. And one of them is the lack of data diversity and k-anonymity failures is one term that's used in this, uh, in this area. Uh, and basically what this means is that if it's known that you are part of a data set, that by itself can reveal something about you. Now, the fact that you're a U.S. citizen, for example, doesn't reveal an awful lot other than the fact, of course, that you're a U.S. citizen. But if you're in some particular uh, health database, for example, that may reveal that um, you were tested for some particular disease, which presumably increases the probability that you actually have that disease. And then um, finally, and again, this is a whole field of study and can get into a lot more detail here, but uh, the, there's a general susceptibility to certain types of attacks. Um, and it actually turns out that when researchers study this kind of thing, a lot of aggregated data and anonymized data that I think the average individual would say, well, yeah, that seems like it's pretty anonymized and that ought to be okay. But researchers have come up with ways, some of which are admittedly probably a bit artificial in real world data sets, uh, where it is at least in principle possible to re-identify um, individuals in those data sets in a number of different ways. And even if they can't do it perfectly, they can do it in a, a statistical way. So we can say, well, I don't know that this data point is this person, but there's a 30% chance, a 50% chance. And in many cases, that's all that you need. Some, uh, in some cases, say if somebody is trying to track down that individual. One of the particular attacks, and this is from a U.S. Census Bureau uh, slide, and the U.S. Census Bureau actually has a lot of good information if you all dig into this kind of thing in more detail. And on the right-hand side, you have certain types of aggregation with, with statistical measures against those aggregates. So a number of females, a number of males, the numbers uh, numbers of uh, white, black, married, black females, etc., and uh, you know those, none of those are one. Uh, you know they they all are an aggregate of some number of individuals, and you know we could increase the numbers here too. But really, you can think of that as almost a set of simultaneous equations which can be solved for. And it again can be transformed then by solving that set of equations into some very specific data points that don't have a name attached to them, but are unique fingerprints, which at least in smaller data sets may make it possible to again, statistically perhaps, figure out what is the entire set of data uh, that applies to this particular individual. We can also identify patterns. This is uh, an online fitness tracker uh, data point, set of data points from some individual. And if you look at these patterns, you can look at that and go, hmm, this individual that this belongs to, I don't know their name, I don't know their address, I don't know anything else about them, but they've 
spend all, they seem to concentrate their time in a fairly limited area, which is where, you know, the, the bright white is in that, uh, in that screenshot. And we might infer the person lives right around there somewhere. Now, maybe they get in their car and they drive to a park and that's where they do their running. Um, maybe. Uh, but if, if, again, if somebody is trying to track somebody down, for example, uh, something like this would give them a pretty good idea. And uh, you know, certainly similar if this was done with GPS, uh, GPS tracks from automobiles or anything like that. Uh, yeah, you know, if, if somebody is always coming and going to this house, that tells us something about that, that's probably where they live. And if they're going a lot to another person, another house somewhere, well, that tells us something as well about their patterns. Particularly interesting area and probably particularly relevant today and will be very relevant when we talk about uh, differential privacy is this idea of linkage attacks. So what we have here in the left is hospital visits for an individual. This is an anonymized, in principle, anonymized record. There's you know, no one's name here. There's no social security number here. Um, but it does include some relevant identifying information, a date of birth, gender, and a zip code. Date of birth, we could fuzz that a bit by just changing that to a year, as I mentioned earlier. Um, zip code is presumably a five digit zip code, not a nine digit zip code. Although even then zip codes can be pretty small when you get into more rural, uh, rural areas, for example. But you know, let's assume for purposes of argument that we have a record that taken by itself is pretty anonymous. Well, the same individual has other records that uh, or out there in open data sets, or even that uh, may be legally required to be public for various reasons. So voter registration in many places will have information like name, address, phone number, and as well as maybe date of birth, gender, almost certainly zip code. Um, and again, you can argue, you know, how much of this is public in a given case, but for for purposes of our discussion here, you know, let's assume that there is some number of fields that might overlap with a, sen with a piece of sensitive data. And we can start to do correlations. And of course, there's not just one public record, there's probably many public records. And to illustrate this, a particularly interesting example uh, comes from a number of years back uh, when many of you may remember there was something called the Netflix Prize. And the idea with Netflix Prize was Netflix released a whole bunch of records that were anonymized, so no names, uh, no usernames, no, uh, no zip codes, no... Um, other information, IP addresses that maybe could start to give a fingerprint for a user, even if their name wasn't attached. And these records were, you know, basically, you know, uh, Alice uh, really liked these three movies, hated these four movies. Bob loved this one movie, hated everything else, and so forth. Um, and it you was know, anonymized, supposedly. Uh, now, what these researchers did was they took that Netflix data, uh, which was intended basically for researchers to develop machine learning algorithms to improve Netflix's recommendation engine, which didn't really work out all that well for other reasons that aren't relevant here. But in any case, there was this large public data set. And what these researchers did was they looked at an other public data set which is the in, which is the rating information in the Airnet Movie database, um, and you know again you have users who um, 
like movies, don't like movies, and so forth. Um, and in those cases, uh, at least some of those users are probably able to be uh, identified because they may have a name that they use across different logins. They may use something that is their actual real life name, their real true name. Um, and by combining those two different data sets, what the researchers were able to do was essentially look at everybody's fingerprint in the Netflix data and everybody's fingerprint in the IMDB data and discover that, you know, if somebody liked these three movies and hated these four movies and maybe no one hates, hardly anybody hates one of those four movies, and yet there's a very similar record in the IMDB database that has a very similar type of fingerprint, you start going, you know, that might very well be the same person. And I'm not going to keep repeating this. This may be a, this may be a statistical inference. We may not be 100% sure. It's not a smoking gun we can take to court, but it starts to be a pretty good indicator. And maybe you can correlate them with yet yeah, a third database of some sort, which uh, has a similar type of correlation pattern, and we can start to de-anonymize the data. Now, nothing here is, you know, it's probably it's probably not a um, a serious matter if someone uncovers that. Aha! He didn't like the Star Wars prequels. Well, did anyone like Star Wars prequels? But that, yeah, that's a different matter. But certainly you can imagine this being a more serious case if we were talking healthcare records, for example. Um, this is not a new problem and solutions to this are not new. Uh, going back to the 1930s, the US Census, for example, stopped publishing small area data. And this is the sort of problem I was talking about earlier. You know, if you have a census tract that you know, one family or two families lived in and you publish that aggregate data data, well, you're not really anonymizing it because there aren't that many people that could be in that small area. This, by the way, is a, is a similar type of thing to what, say, Red Hat does with employee surveys, where that's ask uh, uh, responds a whole bunch of questions, including questions about their manager, and then the aggregated data is published uh, within the company, and data is also shared directly with the individuals. Uh, managers, but it's only shared with them if they have a certain number of direct reports. Because after all, if they only have one direct report, the aggregation of the data of their direct reports is the same thing as how that individual answered. And even if you had two or three direct reports, um, you know, and the manager in, in aggregate gets a you know, bad rating, and they have a good working relationship with two of their employees and a bad relationship with their third employee, um, you know, they, they can make pretty good inferences from that. But let's fast forward to today and start and talk about formal privacy, which the U.S. Census Bureau adopted in 2020. And specifically, the technique of differential privacy, which comes from a 2006 paper, so it's, it's fairly recent, uh, about something called epsilon differential privacy specifically. And the impetus of differential privacy is the fact that as you have all these very large data sets, as machine learning has gotten extremely powerful, a lot of the traditional, make cases somewhat ad hoc statistical disclosure limitation techniques are really starting to be ineffective. And 
intuition and intuitions about what was sufficient anonymization were becoming less and less useful. And the basic idea here is widely shared statistics over a set of data without revealing anything about the individuals. That's the real objective here. Some of the requirements what be a formal model. Um, so again, not ad hoc, but having math against it. Resist both these kind of linkage attacks I've talked to, and, I, and hopefully resist future attacks that we might not know about today. And importantly, and again, one of the main impetus behind it is to be effective in places where there may be a lot of these external data sets available. The basic way differential privacy works is injecting random data into a data set in a mathematical rigorous way to protect individual privacy. And the value of the randomness trades off privacy and utility and accuracy. So if you look at the right hand side here, you, the idea is that you have data is aggregated by a trusted curator, Alice, you have a querier who uh, you can't trust not to uh, try and get at sensitive data. The querier uh, puts query in to the curator. The curator comes up with an answer. And then the curator adds some noise. That, and that noise is mathematically guaranteed to be sufficient to keep the querier from being able to de-anonymize uh, the subject of their query. And the other way to kind of think about this is that you have this real world computation. So you've got a query, a request, do some computation, get an output. You have a different input that, that doesn't include the data from somebody. Uh, an individual, do computation analysis of that, output it. The difference between those two is at most an, a value of epsilon. Um, this is, so in other words, you can have a data set and you, you, you don't know mathematically whether an individual person is in that data set or not. There are some limitations here. Um, Base rate, so basically, if I know certain public uh, characteristics about you, such as sex, age, and so forth, I can infer certain things about you, such as your likelihood to come down, come down with some disease without knowing any private information about you. Um, having anonymizing data doesn't change that fact. The noise is something of concern uh, in that there is this idea that you, have, that you are injecting noise into data. So at some level, the result isn't as good as it could be otherwise. And this was a concern uh, by a number of researchers with the US Census use of technique, for example. Uh, subsequent research suggests that in general, you can you can strike a pretty good balance here between I get between protection of sensitive data and the accuracy of the overall aggregated data set. The final and probably the most difficult problem here is the idea of repeated queries. You know, I mentioned this epsilon. Uh, is epsilon value earlier. And it's probably a better way just to talk about it is you're, you can set a privacy budget. The thing is you use up that budget every time you do a query against a set of data, which is a particular problem in a lot of modern systems where you're doing digital queries rather than just having an, some aggregated tables that you can, uh, that you can access to. And this, there are ways to deal with this. So for example, a randomized subset of data can be, can be used. Uh, 
and, and once you re the privacy budget is exceeded, you can have a different randomized subset of data. So there are techniques there, but nonetheless, it's a limitation. Now, all of this is assumed that we have a trusted third party, but what if we don't? And that's where the multi-party computation I mentioned at the beginning comes in. This is essentially collaborative analysis of siloed data sets without trusting a third party. Essentially, you have a protocol that is equivalent to an incorruptible trusted party. And conceptually, some of this is similar to how enterprise uh, distributed ledger technology blockchains work. And the basic mechanism here is that parties can jointly compute a function on their own on input on a share of inputs using a protocol without information about those inputs being revealed um, the objective here is to preserve privacy and correctness uh, at the same time, there, there is an assumption, and there is an assumption that some number of participants will be trying to break the protocol, uh, will collude with each other, and exactly how you implement multi-party computation does somewhat depend on the threat model that you're assuming. So if you're assuming that one party may uh, by design or by accident, reveal data uh, if they could. That is a different threat model than if you assume 50% of the parties may collude in a way to sort of pierce the veil, so to speak. And then you also need to think about how much overhead is involved. Uh, it works by you have a protocol distributing encrypted, uh, specifically AES, shares of data. Uh, as I said, the implementation and efficiency depends on threat assumptions. And although there's different overheads with different threat models and so forth, in general, we can say that unlike, say, fully homomorphic encryption, the compute overhead is fairly low, but there's a lot of communications overhead. You could go all these cryptographic uh, communi encrypted communications taking place between parties. Uh, one specific use of this, I uh, came uh, out of Boston University in the city of Boston, where uh, participating companies shared their individual wage data, but uh, in a way that was protected by cryptography. So they, they weren't letting any third party actually see the unencrypted data shares. If you are interested in this topic, um, we've actually written uh, and had some interviews on Red Hat Research Quarterly, and uh, give you a plug, this is one of the organizations at Red Hat I do a lot of work with. Uh, suggest you subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, there's also a related website that has a lot of information about ongoing uh, research happening at Boston University and other universities that are associated uh, with, with Red Hat Research. Um, Boston University Red Hat Collaboratory is where some of that's taking place. And I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, Andrew Trask and Open Mind. Uh, if you're a sort that likes to get their hands dirty in this stuff, um, there is a Python set, Python libraries there that let you play around with differential privacy and multi-party computation. So with that, thank you. And we have some time for some questions. Does anyone out there have any questions? Yeah, as, as I did drop in the chat, um, we the privacy was actually the topic at um, this week's. We we split up uh, Red Hat Research Day into some topic oriented shorter sessions uh, this month, and we um, we had a session in privacy earlier this week, and we'll have video up from that uh, 
hopefully fairly soon. So if you're interested in this topic, that'd be a great place to go for some more. Well, if nobody has any questions, um, uh, you know, I will sign off. You can always uh, reach me at ghalf uh, at redhat.com if you have any questions. And I'm also on Twitter with the same handle, assuming I can get my Twitter working properly again one of these days. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>